Ephesians chapter 4 will be here in verses 17 to about seven verses down to verses 24. Title today, uh, In the Future. And either way, if I get it here, there we go. Yeah, In the Future. And I title that because, you know, sometimes it'd be nice to get a good glimpse of what tomorrow might bring, right? When you make a decision, when you have to make a decision. Uh, and life is full of decisions, is it, is it not? It's always, you know, you've got to make a decision almost every single day. And sometimes it would be great to get an idea of what that decision may bring. And uh, if we're able to see the future, uh, we might adjust our thinking, right? Or, or, or the, in some sense, the, the process of how that decision came about. We, might, we would adjust that. And it's kind of like doing a housing project, is it not? Like with paint. Anybody painted a house before? Or paint the inside of a house? Yeah. You, you go to you know, wherever you want to go, a store, you get a nice color, and you paint it, you make a paint decision, and then you realize after you put it on the wall, whoa, that's not good. I really wish I w- would have known that would have looked like that. Well, either way, I did this once. It was in our first house there in Al- Altoona, and uh, I remember Liz was working, I wanted to be a nice guy, you know, and I decided to go and pick a paint color. I picked a, 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 a nice color. It was red, nice bright red. As that would look tremendous, beautiful in our living room. Well, I painted that thing, and I painted a little bit, and I, just like anybody, you paint a little wall, and you're like, eh. You know, if I do the whole thing, it might look even better. So I painted the whole living room, the whole living room, this bright red, And boy, I wish I would have known what that color would have looked like after putting it on the wall. Because I was like, wow, I'm going to die. (laughs) And Liz worked about a 12-hour shift. She was in Connemont, nurse at the time. And so either way, I was waiting for the wrath to come. (laughs) But everybody knows Liz. But either way, uh, I didn't get the wrath. But she came home super tired, and I looked at her and said, I'm going to change it. Don't worry. It's, I understand that's ugly. Don't worry about it. I'm going to change it. Okay. But through that process and even through the marriage and things like that, we learn through decisions and, and husbands, you don't make, you know, when it comes to painting, ask your wife first. I've learned that the hard way. I know certain colors my wife really likes now. And in a lot of cases, I just don't go to Home Depot or Lowe's anymore without her. I said, what do you like? Let's do it. And you make that decision. I wish I would have, you know, again, in the future, would have, would have saw what that paint color looked like. And, you know, Liz, is, you know, she was not upset. She just said, I'm going to bed. <laughs> um, so, but either way, in the future, I have a good feel of what her color, would, you know, what, what color Liz would like now. And, and if I don't, I'm just not going to guess anymore, nor surprise. I'm not going to surprise anymore. But today's not about paint. The topic is not about paint today. Okay, but I bring this to our attention because in the future, Paul really brings a passage here that he tells us here in Ephesians 4 that from now on, meaning in the future, from now on, we aren't to walk like the world. We are not to to walk like the world. Let's read it together in verses 17 and on. This This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord... That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of the heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Paul tells us here that from now on, as born-again believers, as someone who's put their faith and trust in what Christ has done for man, that cross, that from now on we are not to walk like the world. We're to be different, as Paul would proclaim here. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. He's stating here, it's good for all of us, He testifies in the Lord. The Lord is his witness, and he's saying we're not to walk like the world. No longer walk or live. Because a lot of times we 
aren't walking sometimes. We're sitting like we're doing now. But we're living amongst us. We're not to be living like the unsaved. When he says the world, the Gentiles, this is, we're not to be living like them. What, how are we to be living though? Well, he has a, a tremendous passage here in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. If you would like to turn there with me. Keep your fingers in Ephesians. But Paul desires this for you and I. Again, he starts Ephesians 4 off. In Ephesians 4, 1, the concept is that he tells us, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. But he wants us to walk to, according to our calling. He wants us to walk as children of God. And here in Romans 12, 1 and 2, a tremendous passage of Scripture. We all should know it, learn it, and live it. But look what he says here. He says, I beseech you, verse 1, He begs you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to what? This world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect Will of God. He doesn't say to be conformed to the world so you understand the will of God. He says he wants you to be transformed by his word. Renew your mind so that you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. People want to know what the will of God is. Well, God's word is very clear. Get in the book. We sing that song in Grace Kids Camp. Get in the book. And the kids love it. They jump on tables and they love it. Get in the book. What's that mean? We're trying to encourage the kids to get in the book. Get in God's Word. Have God's words transform your life so you can make good decisions. Because decisions are to be made almost every single day. Just like the paint color. It was a bad decision. I should have read Ephesians 5. (laughs) Family order. I should have talked to my wife. But Paul here says in Ephesians here, back to it all, he says, I don't want you to walk as other Gentiles. I don't want want you to walk as they walk in the vanity of their mind. That's what he says. I don't want you to to walk this way in the vanity of their mind. What what that is, is is what is devoid of truth. They're completely without truth. He doesn't want you to walk around with your head cut off. There you go, Sophia, like a chicken. (laughs) In this case, turkey. But the fact is, he doesn't want you to walk completely without truth. Meaning that he's saying that these Gentiles, the unsaved world, they have zero ounce of truth in them. He says, you're not to walk like that. I testify in the Lord, you henceforth walk, what's the next word? Not. If you take that out, he says walk. But that's one, he's not not getting that. He's constantly reaffirms that through all his epistles we're not to walk like the lost. We're to be different. We're not to walk like we don't know anything. We're not to walk like we don't know the love of Christ. And the, reason, and the purpose is because we're his ambassadors. If we walk around like other Gentiles walk, what happens with that? The lost will stay what? Lost. They have zero knowledge of God. Go to 2 Corinthians here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3. I actually just read verse 1 and 2. Tremendous. We always, you know, sometimes skip that verses, but here. 2 Corinthians 4, one says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. You have a ministry. You're the ambassadors for Christ. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. People are watching you and I, are they not? It's easy to walk in newness of life here in church, is it? But when you walk out these doors, what are you doing? You're walking in the world. But he says here, what is the world filled with? If our gospel 
Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to what? Give to give. For God, let's read it again. Read it together. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to what? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure on earth invested in the excellency of the power maybe of God and what? Not of us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. And if we are not getting the gospel out, if we're not going, you know, we have a Christmas parade going up, we have people who will walk, and it's a lot of walking. I get, you, I get that. My feet are going to be hurting. <laughs> I'm going to be complaining about it later too and get some ice. That's okay. But the fact is, we got to get the gospel out. We have to share the glorious gospel because why? Because the lost will stay lost without it. Unless the light of the glorious gospel gets out, they'll stay lost. That's, and I said it again, I'll say it again today. What can we not do when we're in heaven? Give the gospel. We can't give the gospel. When we're in heaven, praise God, we have our hope. Praise God that we're going to be, we're blessed, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm thankful for that. But the one thing that you and I cannot do when we're in heaven is to share the gospel. And Paul is adamant. If you haven't seen Paul's journey and through the book of Acts, Acts 13 and on, that man had a, had a desire through his epistles he's written to the churches and to the individuals. He had a desire to share the gospel. He had a desire to do it. That was his main focus because God wants all men to be saved and then what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. But salvation is first. We have to get the gospel out. And if we're walking like we have our heads cut off like chickens, we don't know the truth, we're walking like that, is the world going to see anything different? Absolutely not. They're not going to see anything different. And so I have this little picture up here. You know, what path do you want to take? You want to take the world's path or God's path? He, God, Paul says, I don't want you to walk down the, one, you know, the way that other Gentiles walk. It's unfruitful. There's a, you know, Gentiles lost. Satan has blinded their minds. We're in a spiritual warfare. He does his best. He does his best. And we're to be given the gospel out. He says, I don't want you to be walking like that. Because he's just, listen, these Gentiles here, I don't want you to walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of what? Their heart. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance, meaning lack of knowledge that is in them. You know, there's another tremendous passage here in the, the word ignorant. You could probably fill a whole church up with that. Ignorant people sometimes. But 1 Thessalonians 4, go there real quick with me. Paul emphasizes this again in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18. It's a tremendous hope as believers when we know that someone has gone home to be with the Lord and they knew Christ as their Savior, that we're going to see them again, right? That's a tremendous feeling. But Paul, he starts his passage off and he says, verse 13 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, he says, but I would not have you to be what? Ignorant. Lack of knowledge. I would have you not to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In a tremendous past right here, wherefore what? Comfort one another with these words. Don't be ignorant, folks. Don't be like the lost. Don't, you know, if we, you've, it's a tremendous thing. It, it actually, in my lot, comforts you a little bit when you know you've, someone has gone home to be with the Lord. You know where they're at. It's comforting. But he says, in a lot of ways, he's saying, don't feel sorry for them. They're in paradise. They're with the Lord. Worry about the lost. He says, worry about the gospel. Get the gospel out to the lost because they have zero hope. They're headed to hell. It's because of their lack of knowledge. Paul here, Paul here in Ephesians 4 says, I don't want you to walk like them. They're, you don't need to walk like them. You have a greater purpose. You're to walk worthy of your calling. Their, their lack of knowledge is because of the blindness of their heart. They have given themselves... Over to lasciviousness, it says. Don't walk like that, he says. Who being past feeling have given themselves over what? Unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. They have given themselves to, over to unbridled lust, shamelessness, outrageousness. Almost has the idea that they're saying, I will settle my lust or my flesh at any cost, meaning to death. That's their mindset. That they're fulfilling the lust, their flesh, their fleshly desires. Paul says you're not to be walking like them. Nothing good comes from it all. And the last part here, greed rolls them. You see that? Greed rolls them. Look at what Paul tells Timothy here in 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6 here. First Timothy 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness... He is proud, knowing nothing but dotting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil submersings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is what? Godliness. From such withdrawal thyself. But godliness with contentment is what? Is great gain. Sometimes we don't like where we're at in our life, but God says, what's he say in that verse? But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. I guarantee you, Paul did not enjoy being in prison his whole, almost his whole life. But God used him. He used it for his glory and honor. And that's why in Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do what? All things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And he was, what was, who was he beside the whole time when he wrote that? Roman soldier. He was in his prison, by the way. When I am weak, he is strong. But he says again, greed rules the world. And what is one thing that the world will tell you? I hear this time and time again. You hear this all the time. Supposing that gain is godliness. It's incorrect. Verse 7 says, we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that, which fall, that, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And if you've gone here for a while, you understand the flee, follow, fight. Pastor Stewart's got, done messages on that before. And what's it say? Flee, right? But thou, a man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. 
Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Why you, thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. The world wants you to say, what? Gain is godliness. You get a good old raise. Oh, whoa, yes. That's not it. That's not it at all. It's not saying that, you, you know, we all have jobs and we all need money to pay the bills, do we not? Everything comes from God, though. You better understand that. And he says, don't focus on that. Don't let that be your life. Do not lust after those things. Don't let the world consume you. Don't let the world consume you. Quit being like other Gentiles. Because you're not that. We're not to be walking as the world. We aren't to walk like them. And the one question I would have, if you're walking like the world, your neighbors and friends and family members, will they ever see Christ? Doubt it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he actually says, I speak this to your shame. The, the, the resurrection chapter, they were questioning some things. They had some questions, questioning even the resurrection. Just You keep there in Ephesians, but listen to this. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. And he says, I speak this to your shame. Learn from that example, that passage of Scripture. We're not to be walking like this world. It's on us, folks. We're His ambassadors. God's using the body of Christ to present the glorious gospel of what Christ has done for this world, to present it to the world, to our friends and family members and neighbors. We're His instruments. We're to get the message out, not to walk like the world. Because their minds are already corrupt, they're already lost, their, their, their hearts are blinded. Satan wants to keep them that way. But they can stay that way if we don't get that light, the glorious gospel out. We know the future is bright for you and I, right? As believers in Christ, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in how many places? We know it's bright for us. It's filled with all spiritual blessings. But if we're living in this world right now in the future, starting now, starting right now, let's stop living like the world. Stop living like it. And we need to focus on the Lord. And I put that there. Why? I said, why? Focus on the Lord. Because I want you to squint. <laughs> squint at it. Because when you're trying to focus on something, right? You're, you're really focused, right? You're focused on the Lord. God, that's what Paul says. I want you to be focused on the Lord. Read verses 20 with me. After he just dresses these, gen what, quit walking like these Gentiles, the unsaved. He says, verse 20 and 22, But ye have not so learned Christ? If so be that you have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is what? Corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Verse 20 tells us that we're, But ye have not so learned Christ. Paul says in contrast with what he just brought up to them, you have not learned Christ this way. I did not teach Christ to you this way. You didn't, I didn't teach you to walk like other Gentiles. It's a confrontation between Paul and this, this church here. But it's a confrontation through God, through you and I. God's Word doesn't teach us to walk like the Gentiles. Why are you walking like it? I haven't taught you this way. You haven't learned Christ this way. In verse 21 he says, You have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. Paul illustrates the fact that they have been taught about the Lord Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul. He's the Apostle of the Gentiles. He's our Apostle. When you learn about the Lord Jesus Christ through Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, does he ever tell us to walk like the world? No, I can find plenty of passages. We just skimmed a couple. He, said, he always says, put on the new man. 
Exercise thyself unto godliness. You haven't taught, you, I haven't taught you this way. Paul has taught them according to the revelation and the mystery that was given to him to dispense. The words that Paul has spoken to him are the commandments of the Lord. And that's scriptural, by the way. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. It says, If any man think of himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are what? The commandments of the what? The Lord. He says, I, I'm telling you the commandments of the Lord. I got the message for you, and I, you did not, I did not teach you to walk like the Gentiles. I didn't teach you to walk like the world. That's not what, I didn't teach you about that. I taught you to walk in the truth of God's word. And see, they, they know the truth of God's word. Paul says, I told you that. You were taught that way. And you know, you and I know right from wrong, do we not? You better say yes. <laughs> it's like dealing with my children, you know. You know right from wrong. Dad, you never told me. The Word of God tells us what right and wrong is, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2, we read it from the beginning. You get your mind transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may know what is a good and acceptable, what? Perfect will of God. You can make good decisions then. We know right from wrong. The Word of God teaches us good things. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. We all know the verse of Scripture. I put it up there for you. But it says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is what? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for what? Correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. Word of God is good for it all. That's why we preach the Word of God here. The Bible is a very important thing for our lives. And don't ever forget about the verse before these two, where Paul tells you about who he learned from a child, from his grandma and his mom, the Word of God. It's important to realize that, that even at a young age, you can teach our children, parents, grandparents, we can teach our children about what? The Word of God. Don't ever forget that, the importance of that. The Word of God, it teaches us good things. And by the way, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And the grace of God teaches us what? That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this what? Present world. That's what the Word of God can do for us. It teaches us. It teaches us good things. Teaches us very good things. But you know, the one thing that we have to do as believers in Christ, born again believers, per people who have trusted Christ as what He's done for us on that cross, we have to let the Word of Christ dwell in our hearts. Look over, you're already in Ephesians, but look over to Ephesians 3, verses 17. Ephesians 3, 17. He says that Christ that Christ might, may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. That word dwell. we got to let Christ dwell in our hearts. That means literally means giving the keys to the Lord. Here you go, Lord. You take it. You take my heart. Make yourself at home in my life. That's like giving the keys to your neighbor to your house. Saying, make yourself at home. Well, good luck with that. But that's what God's saying. Let Christ dwell in your hearts. Make yourself at home. Do you make do you tell people to make yourself at home when you go to your someone, you know, when you go to someone's house, do you, or you go to, you know, someone comes to your house? Do you say make yourself at home? Don't you dare tell me that. I'll make myself at home. I'll find the fridge real quick. And yes, Cheryl and Steve have. Make yourself at home. That's what that says. That's what that says. Dwell in your hearts. Make yourself at home, Lord. I want you to take over. It has a Proverbs 3, verse 5. Go to Proverbs 3 real quick. We all know the passage of Scripture here. But I want you to, I want you to look at the, the verses right after it. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 8. 
We want Christ to dwell in our hearts. We need to let it, allow it. Here you go, Lord. Take it. Take my life. Use it. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he what? Shall direct thy paths. Be not wise. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. I love that passage of Scripture. Be not wise in thine own eyes, right? Because the things that you see are what? Temporal. But the things that you don't see are what? Eternal. We're to trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean unto thine... No. Lean not unto thy own understanding. A lot of times, when you're trusting the Lord, you're really, you're putting your life into His hands. Are you not? That's what you're doing. You're trusting Him through the process. And I, listen, I got a little experience about this. We moved to Wisconsin. Why? Because we trusted the Lord. And you know, the two places my wife said she would never go were Michigan I'm not going to live in Michigan. Don't ever say it. In Wisconsin. Yeah. Guess what the Lord called us? Wisconsin. Praise the Lord. He called us back to Altoona. But the fact is you trust the Lord. And through that process, though, the Lord grew our family. Yes, we have Nolan now. We have a Wisconsin knight. <laughs> born, born and raised in Wisconsin. But the fact is the Lord used it. We had to depend on ourselves. Her and I. And yet we had a church family that helped us out. But we didn't have any family there. We had to make different decisions. Tough decisions. Depend on each other more. We had to, our prayer life got more serious. Let me tell you that. We had to work things out again. Our marriage got stronger. The Lord used that. Trust in the Lord with what? all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't, that's what he wants from you and I. He wants us to trust him through the process. That's what he wants. He wants it to, us to allow him to dwell in our hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in your hearts. And in Ephesians 4.22, he also says, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts. Yeah, I want you to put off. Put off the old man. That's not who you are. You weren't taught that way. You have the Word of God. Let it dwell in your hearts. You were not taught that way. And put off the old man. Shake it off. Kick it off. Because you were what? You were identified in His death, burial, and resurrection. That's why Galatians 2.20 is a powerful verse of Scripture. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. And the life which I what? now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a powerful verse of Scripture. Your old man has been paid for. It's dead. Sin does not own you anymore. Your old man has been crucified. It's, it's Romans 6. But a tremendous, a tremendous song that we sing time and time again. It's on the slide. Living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glorious day. Will that not be a glorious day? But in Romans, He tells us He's paid for our sins. Our sins have been paid for. We are identified as death, burial, and resurrection. We don't, sin does not own us. You can live a life more pleasing to Him. You have new life through the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go to Romans 6. I love verses 11 and 12 to 13. Tremendous. He says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sins, but alive unto God through who? 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. He says, put away the old man. You don't, sin does not own you. Live in newness of life. Your old man's been crucified. You need to focus on the Lord. Focus on the Lord. Go back to Ephesians. Let me read this verse, passage of Scripture in Galatians 6.14. He says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The world is dead to you and you're dead to the world. You have newness of life. You're ambassadors of Christ and you have a heavenly hope. That's our home. We're the ambassadors for him. Live your life that way. We have to focus on God. Do not live like other Gentiles. Put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. We know the future is bright for you and I. Do we not? Hey, you better say amen. You should be excited about that. We fill those spiritual blessings of heavenly places upon salvation. We did nothing for it, by the way. That's by God's grace alone. If we're living as the world in the future, we need to do start right now. Stop it. Paul says, stop it. God says through Paul, stop it. Focus on the Lord and then be enlightened by the Spirit. Read verses 23 and 24. Ephesians 4. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true, what? Holiness. We're to let the word of God work in us. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, what? Which you heard of us, you received it not as what? The word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you, what? Say it. Also, also in that you believe. The word of God works in your life. We need a healthy diet of God's word. We have to be enlightened by...